Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. I work for the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Paul and I belong to the Urban Analytics team. We are the analytical arm at CNT. We support program uh, analytical work at CNT, but we also build a lot of uh, web-based advocacy tools. You, some of you might have come across uh, two of our tools, the it Housing and Transportation Affordability Index and All Transit, which shows you the value of transit in communities across the country. All right, so why are we here today? Uh, we're here to talk about Justice 40 and uh, the work we did in analyzing a tool put out by the federal government. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Justice 40. So about two years ago, uh, the, the Biden administration announced an initiative called Justice 40, which is going to bring in investment into disadvantaged communities, communities that have uh, uh, be, been, been left behind, uh, underinvested in for, for many decades. And the goal of this initiative is to bring in 40% of all federal infrastructure monies into communities. And the benefits of whom of these investments will benefit communities that are identified as disadvantaged. So getting this definition of disadvantaged communities is very important because you, you know, either qualify or you don't. Uh, so to do that, the federal government launched the CGIS tool, the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. We reviewed it, and we had mixed feelings about it. So we did, oh, we did what we know best, but to give you a little bit uh, of an introduction about the tool itself, it uh, qualifies census tracts based on 35 indicators across climate, environmental, and socioeconomic domains into disadvantaged communities. So you either qualify if you, uh, you know, uh, qualify as per one of the climate and environmental factors or if you meet, and if you meet the socioeconomic factor. <clears throat> so we reviewed the data, we analyzed the data, and we had some critiques. And some of them are mentioned over here. Race, ethnicity, which is a driver of underinvestment, historic uh, <clears throat> prejudice has not, is not included on the tool. Cumulative burden is not, include, is not considered. So if you were impacted by one issue, you're treated the same as if you were impacted by eight issues. <clears throat> So yeah, there's an over-reliance on the socioeconomic indicator because uh, every tract has to qualify for that one indicator um, in addition to any one of the 35, well, there's, uh, yeah, 35 um, environmental indicators. Um, so some of the things that we've done so far, um, CGIS re released a beta, um, I forget exactly when, but we re, we um, and and they and to their credit they um, you know they were seeking um, input, so um, we um, submitted comments um, and we wrote a blog um, with uh, a couple other nonprofits um, uh, collaborating together and um, and we developed this tool. Um, and uh, to just kind of expose um, some of the shortcomings or, or potential um, changes to it. So, um, so there was an email that went around um, when this when CGIS uh, released um, the beta version, and um, um, so you know this is their web this is their current website uh, screenshot, um, but they. Um, you know they're on GitHub. Um, they also have a download page, so they they're good about um, sharing the data. Um, but this is their mapping tool. It basically shows census tracts that are disadvantaged um, or not. Um, so um, so what? So I I came to the download page, and um, in this case, it was uh, fairly easy for us to. Um, to start working on because it's based on census tracts and we do a lot of work um, with um, 
census data, so already had the census tracts. So all I needed was the CSV file, so I downloaded that and imported it um, into our database to, to work. So um, since it's Chiac night, I thought I'd um, share the technology, not that it's not all that impressive, but um, um, so we, uh, we do all our web tools. Um, we use Amazon Web Services. Um, we've been doing that for a number of years. Um, and um, so we use EC2 as our um, web server um, and uh, running Ubuntu, Apache, PHP. Um, and uh, we use an RDS instance uh, for, for our Postgres uh, database. And we use Post, the PostGIS extension for our spatial um, data, which is, uh, you know, most of the work we do is spatial. Um, so, um, you know, this, this project required the uh, 2019 um, Tiger census tracts, which I don't, if you're familiar with uh, the census, they, they kind of redo everything every 10 years, but it makes minor incremental changes in the, in the years uh, between. So uh, there's a big difference between uh, 2019 and 2020, but not so big a difference between 18 and 19. It, all the way up to 19, they're based on the 2010 tracks. So. Um, and we needed um, the U.S. American Community Survey data just for some additional demographics. Uh, Preeti mentioned that they did not uh, use race, ethnicity in uh, determining disadvantaged census tracts and did not include the data originally. Um, but um, not that it's necessarily a result of our comments, because I think a lot of people commented on that. Um, but they did, in their, in their current version, they did include the race ethnicity data, but uh, did not use it. So, um, um, and, and I don't, I don't, I think there, the reasons, uh, my understanding is that the reasons are just um, so that they don't set themselves up for lawsuits um, or something like that. Someone could probably, uh, um, word that better than me, but um, 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 so, and then the other data I needed is a CGIST uh, data, which is just a, a flat file, uh, CSV. Um, um, and then the other technology we use um, for our web mapping tools is um, Mapbox and Mapbox GL. Um, and um, map, we, we, um, we, we, we use Mapbox as our um, front end, but we we don't pay Mapbox to store data. So we 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 host our own Mapbox uh, vector tiles um, from our generated from our code and P and PostGIS uh, data. So um, I could either go right. To, well, I think I'll just go through some slides first because it'll just be a little easier to to talk and and not have to click and stuff. So. Um, this is the URL for our um, tool, um, apps.cnt.org, uh, justice40, slash justice40. Um, so, um, you know, the map shows in yellow all the disadvantaged tracks, and in a pale yellow, uh, the non-disadvantaged tracks, but we also, Here's, we, this is what we do that the CGIS tool doesn't do, is we show tracks that are not disadvantaged, but kind of close. So um, in that maroon color, uh, they have a, at least, um, they qualify for five or more um, categories. And I believe there's like six categories altogether. So they qualify, they have, um, cumulative, they have multiple um, uh, environmental burdens. Um, but they don't qualify because they don't meet that socioeconomic uh, threshold of um, for poverty. Um, we also in blue we show the high concentration of people of color, uh, which is just over fifty percent in our in this case. Um, and then the purple is uh, both the first two, so both uh, uh, over 50% uh, people of color and cum significant cum cumulative environmental burdens. Um, so um, here, zoomed in on Cook County, um, you can see the um, disadvantaged tracks in orange 
people um, looking at the data would, are drawn to the other colors that are, you know, maybe they should be disadvantaged, but they um, they didn't qualify for um, one reason or another. So, um, so you might drill into the data and um, we have some filtering tools that um, just filter the the, um, the map tile data, um, you know, in the, on the client side. And um, so this is a simple filter just to filter out anything other than Cook County, Illinois. Um, so, in, and then the, above the filter, there's some quick stats there that you're looking at three, uh, 1,318 tracks, uh, five plus million uh, people and 58 percent uh, people of color. Um, and then you can f filter more. Here I've got a filter based on um, th these tracks are just the disadvantaged tracks um, and they have, um, they meet the 90th percentile which is the threshold that uh, tracks have to meet for these environmental indicators. They meet the 90th percentile for diesel particulate matter exposure and um, percent pre-1960s housing, which is a uh, surrogate for um, uh, lead paint. So, so people in these tracks are, you know, being exposed to diesel, probably from, you know, traffic and, uh, and possibly for, to, um, to, to lead through, through their paint in their house. Um, I don't think that also includes pipes. I don't know if the pre 1960s it, it's paint. Okay. Um, um, so when you click on a track, tracked, um, you you can see um, how many criteria it meets, um, and also how uh, how many criteria it uh, nearly meets. And in this case, nearly is just 80 to 90 percentile, um, uh, but not 90 to to qualify. Um, and I um, can jump over to the to the site in a moment to expose some more here. But I um, also want to show you um, that we also have an, another way to look at the data, um, and that is uh, on the map. There's a there's a toggle between the default and advanced analysis. And with advanced analysis, you can see not just the orange indicating that a tract is qualified, but you can see for those tracts that are qualified and not qualified, um, the the number of um, cumulative environmental justice impacts. Um, and this is just the number of categories. So each category has one to maybe five different um, individual um, indicators, um, but... Um, so you can see that, that some tracks are much more um, impacted by environmental issues than others. Um, and even some, some tracks that um, are not um, qualified as disadvantaged have some, some uh, you know, significant uh, cumulative impacts. So, um, and then with some sliders um, and check boxes on the, on the right of the map, um, you can kind of tweak the, the criteria. Um, the, one of the, um, so the, the socioeconomic indicator is, um, is this percent, this 200 percent poverty threshold, which is used um, kind of often, I, I think, by the government. Um, it's a national, um, in a national number. Um, set each year, I think. Um, and it, it does have different um, income brack, um, for different household um, sizes. So it might be, you know, two, two working um, adults and, and some number of children or one working adult and, and a number of children. So it varies by household size, um, but it doesn't vary by um, location. And, and we all know that cities can be very expensive. So it doesn't factor in expensive places. So like a city like Chicago or San Francisco or um, New York, you know, these are expensive places to live, um, but they're using the same 200% um, poverty 
um, as as rural areas um, in small towns and stuff. So um, we suggested another number that is also used pretty often, and that is um, uh, a percent of area median income. So the area median income is the median income of the um, um, of the uh, CBSA, which, uh, which I always forget, a region basically. It's our, mm-hmm. Yeah, like a metro region. Our, our CBSA includes uh, a little bit of Wisconsin, a little bit of Indiana, and like seven counties, I think, around Chicago. So uh, whatever the median income is for that is the area median income. So um, I, I, I should have looked it up to, to know what it is in Chicago, but... Um, you know, if, so we're saying if you are, um, what do we say, 80% of a- AMI, then that would be the, the threshold. Oh, yeah, and we, we give you a sliders. So on the next slide, I switch to, oh, not quite. Um, here I zoomed in and on an area, um, and you see the mouse here. Um, I'm going to point to this one particular tract, census tract here. Oh, uh, it's a census tract in McKinley Park on the near south, I don't, I don't know what you call it, near, near south side, not too far south. Um, and we, we, um, we know that there is a, there happens to be a, um, a asphalt factory like across the street from this, this tract. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been one track that we've kind of focused on and we're working with a, with a group, um, in, the, in that area um, um, on another project. But um, so I'm gonna just tweak the, the, the inputs um, a little bit and then you know that tract qualifies. So here what I did is I, I switched to the 200, uh, uh, I switched to the median income as a percent of AMI, at, so 80% of the AMI. Um, and I also included um, minimum percent of people of color at 50 percent. So, you know, our tool allows you to just kind of do some minor adjustments here to, to see how uh, Justice 40 or CGIS would work if, uh, if you changed it a little bit. So, um, so that is uh, the end. And let me just... Um, and I just want to show you all the different um, data points that are included in CGIS. Um, so this, again, is this McKinley Park uh, census tract. Um, and these are the different um, environmental and climate indicators, uh, or categories, rather. And below, within each of these, there's, uh, like I said, one to one or more um, different indicators. So. Each tract has to meet this 93rd percent, uh, 90th percentile or higher. Um, so, in this case, for clean energy uh, and energy efficiency, they actually have two indicators that are at the 89th percentile. Um, you know, just shy of of making it. Um, um, so, all all these um, expand. You know, on your own time, if you care to, you can dig in, Um, but they are at the 47th percentile for poverty in this tract, and they they have to reach the 65th percentile. On the other hand, if it was a percent of AMI, they're only at 64% of the area median income. So, you know, it's not a wealthy uh, tract by any means. So... um, Kind of does it. Kind of our next steps are we're going to keep doing this. Uh, CGIS, um is is um, they 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 say they're going to release an update um, at least every year. So we will we'll look at the data again uh, next year um, when that comes out. Um, but also there are all the other um, or most of the other um, agencies in the U.S. government are. Uh, building their own tools with slightly different uh, methodologies. So we're going to look at those tools as, and, and compare to uh, CGIS and, and provide feedback uh, in, 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 when they ask for it or, or when they don't. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Thank you. 
I'm sorry if this wasn't like super clear, but the uh, is the project like open source or is it more of like a team working on it and uh, like closed off or? Um, yeah, I guess it's not uh, formally open source, um, but the data is available from all, all the data that we're showing here is available. Um, so what's not open source is the code, I guess. But yeah, anyone could 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 um, import it into their own um, you know tool of choice or uh, database of choice and, and, and do something similar. Um, yeah, we don't. Uh, we're just not in the practice of you know posting uh, everything we do on, on GitHub or, or other places. Okay, so the to be clear, the website for Justice 40, uh, the analysis itself, like the tools used, they're not open source, but I mean, the data, of course, is open because it's like census data. That's right, yeah. Okay. And, and in fact, the, the CGIS tool is open source. You could download the, to my understanding, it's open source. It's on GitHub, so you could actually recreate the CGIS tool. Um, you know, just just like it is uh, on their website, um, but our but our tool is not open source. Yeah. So um, it sounds like like one of your goals is to uh, motivate CGIS to change their methodology. What kind of like challenges do you face in you know advocating or, or getting that kind of that kind of change? Challenges, I guess we do get hurt, so that's a good thing. We, we, we are in touch with them. We've spoken to the people who've developed the tool. I think some of the challenges that exist is in all the bureaucracy or all the, like, you know, race, ethnicity not being part of the tool is a big one. But I think there's more of a political hurdle to get through over there. So those are the kind of challenges we face. And then... Every time it's a national tool, trying to get the definition right for a large part of the country becomes challenging. So while there are issues that we know of in certain areas that we work in, it still does a good job. So I think that that's the other hurdle that we, we come across. Like it's 80, 80, 90% there. So it's getting the last 10% accurate. That's been a challenge because it still does a better job than most of the other tools that have existed so far. So I'd say, I'd say those are the bigger challenges. There are, of course, limitations of data availability. Since this is a national tool, there has to be data available <coughs> for every census tract. That remains a challenge because there, there is better local data available on some of these metrics, but it's not available across the US. So that remains a challenge every time you're developing a tool at the national level. Um, so I'd say those are some of the hurdles we face. We're definitely in touch with uh, CGIST or the, the people behind CGIST and continue to share our feedback. And uh, we, we are being heard. These things take a long time to change, though. Although I should say that there, there's, there's been some encour encouraging changes in the latest version that they've, developed, they've released. So they are, they are listening uh, to people's comments. They are taking that in. Uh, they're, they're probably not uh, moving at the speed that we'd like them to move at, but, but there's still progress being made. I actually have a follow-up to that. Um, I'm curious, is there any data you wish you had access to or wish you could consider as part of your own tool that is maybe difficult for you to get or, or process? All of these data sources are accessible. Um, you know, I wish we had better data sources. Um, so some of the data is modeled. Um, like if you look at the census tracts that are impacted by um, particular matter 2.5, so that's, you know, you know t tiny little 2.5 microns or whatever, the dust in the air that you inhale and gets into your, gets into your blood and could be, you know, uh, cause health problems. Um, anyway, the, if when you look at the map, you, for that particular indicator, it just doesn't ring true. You know, we know that there's bad air all over the place. And, um, you know, another, um, you know, one of the indicators is, you know, uh, susceptibility to uh, for a forest fire. Um, and we're working with a group in Colorado, they, they, their census tracts don't, um, don't qualify for that. I mean, they, they, they are disadvantaged tracts for other reasons, but um, they are surprised that they weren't. Well, digging into the data, I looked, and it, for this particular year of um, data, uh, there were a lot of forest fires in California. And if you look at the map for census tracts that qualified, just based on that year of data, you know, a lot of these California tracts qualified 
because they, they they basically rank all the all the census tracts in the country, and then you have to make that 90th percentile. So, um, you know. So anyway, uh, your question. Yeah, I wish we just had better environmental data. Really. Yes, uh, I guess I have two kinds of questions. My first question is is uh, so I guess more practical or political or something like that. Besides trying to influence the Biden administration, what other goals uh, do you have for, for this project? Uh, maybe I should pause if I can ask two questions. I'll ask a more tech question afterwards. Sure, I'd say some goals, of course, are remain to influence the tool, but the other part of this project is we're socializing the tool with community-based organizations across the country. So they understand the impact of the tool on their community or the potential impact on their community, right? Because at the end of the day, it is funding that's coming into communities that potentially haven't seen funding before. So I think we're trying to, like, em empower the groups we work with to also be able to understand data and the implications of a tool like this. So uh, we continue to see the biggest impact or influence we can have on the tool itself. So that continues to be an effort of ours. But then it's about getting people to understand the tool and then holding the administration accountable, right? Uh, so is the money flowing into these communities? That comes in the implementation part, and that's something we have our eye towards as well, because one part is getting the definition right, but then are the investments actually being made in these communities? Are the benefits being reaped by these communities would be part two of, uh, of something we do in the future. Yes, thank you. So uh, my second question, I guess, goes to um, you know analyzing the data. So it seems like this page is, it looks like uh, it's it's a map box uh, uh, widget or something, uh, and uh, maybe some JavaScript wiring everything together. I was wondering whether you're looking at using any other type of uh, map technology. Or it occurred to me that leaf map, uh, you know, might be an interesting type of application to to look at this data through because it combines. Uh, mapping, like the, um, the widget aspect of displaying the information with geospatial analysis. Or, I, I don't know whether, I'm just curious, what else you might be th thinking about doing with, with your data? Huh. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, that. Uh, what did you say? What? Oh, leaf map. It's a, it's a, a package like you can use it through Python. Or oh, okay. Huh. Um, very interesting geospatial huh. analysis. Um, um, yeah, I guess no, <laughs> we, we don't have any other thoughts, but yeah, um, you know, um, our, our chief, uh, scientist, uh, who's not here tonight, Peter Haas, he, you know, he's, uh, he's a physicist by education and, um, but so he's, he's heavy into R and, and, and statistical analysis and stuff like that. So he would be doing more of the that kind of in-depth analysis in I'm more of just a programmer but um, but yeah so we we do use different tools but um, yeah for our web presentations it's lately it's been um, a map map box based um, the vector um, tiles hmm. I just had a couple questions about um, the data and where it comes from uh, first off is the resolution on the data is that county zip code. Yeah, census tract. So uh, yeah, uh, you know the smallest, uh, except for the decennial census, census which includes census blocks. Uh, the smallest um, unit is a block group. Okay. There's a group of blocks, and then a group of block groups form a tract. A group of tracts form a county. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's 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 the data here. Sometimes we get data at zip code, but zip code's actually kind of tricky to work with because they they change so often. And, and uh, but yeah. um, and then my second question was, um, I was just curious as to the data set, uh, like where did you get the energy efficiency data and things like that? That's usually hard to come by. Ah, well, um, I mean that's all included in the C just down. It's on the C. Okay. So yeah, I mean it, it's not the raw data. It, it's just the percentiles. That that uh, so the I don't 
There might be some raw data in there as well, but I. But yeah, it's all based on percentiles. So they they take each uh, statistic and turn it into a percentile. So they, like I said earlier, they rank all the tracks in the country for each of those metrics, and you know, you're, if, if you're 90 percentile or higher, you you qualify for that indicator. Um, what does a uh, contribution to the project look like for someone who wants to like maybe enter in and help? Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So this, this, uh, so we've typically worked within our urban analytics team. Uh, or we'd, we'd welcome participation, thought, thought, collaboration, all of that. So uh, let's talk more. We, we, we haven't typically had interest in, in things like these, but I guess we were not reaching out to the right community. But uh, let's, let's talk. Let's talk, I'd say. <clears throat> Thank you. This sort of goes up a level, and it's about this 40% of funding to disadvantaged areas. Is that sort of unprecedented in federal policy, or is it a refinement of what has gone on before? Uh, oh, because traditionally, things have been allocated simply by populations, right? Like just the absolute value of, or relative value of population in a given area. So any, th any knowledge about that? Thanks. Um, so... You know, we, we found with the most recent release that nearly 40% of all census tracts, 37%, I think it is, and just shy of that in population, um, maybe 35% of the population, actually qualify as disadvantaged or, uh, oh, yeah. So, so um, our initial thought was, you know, 40% basically going to 40% of the population is not really, you know, it's not very uh, profound. Um, but um, we got feedback from, I forget who now, but, um, you know, saying that, you know, th that just did not happen in the past. So, you know, that, that was um, an improvement, <laughs> surprisingly. But do we, we don't know the baseline, right? So we don't, no one's ever gathered or collected that information to say, did it go up from 25% to 40%? We don't know that. Every, everything that we, we've read or understood tells us that this is an improvement from what existed, but we've never calculated the baseline. Um, it's kind of a similar question on that line from the live stream. Um, is, there account, is there an accountability map showing where funds are landing? Is there a model for how that might look? Um, how do we know if 40% of funds are going to uh, frontline communities? There is a dashboard. For, uh, the OMB does have a dashboard. Um, it, it talks about all investments, but you would need to do some additional analysis to see where the money is going in. But they're being more transparent than previous administrations with, with there being a dashboard. So there's, there would, I mean, I'd say that's the initial step. We are yet to analyze or look at that information, but there is, there is a dashboard which is exposing where investments are being made. Thank you. Uh, as far as your community level uh, engagement with this project, uh, how does that work out? How, uh, how do you engage community organizations? I can talk about this project and broadly what we do. At CNT, a lot, all the projects we work on, I'd say most of our work happens to be in the Chicago area, and we have a network of community organizations that we work with over here. Every project we work in has a, a CBO involved as well, a community-based organization. On this project, um, not on the an uh, analysis side, but the implications of the analysis, we're working with five of those groups across the country, some who qualify, some who don't. And what, what we want to uncover through that process is the story behind the community, right? What we see on the map is a census tract, but there's a lot happening in those tracts. So we want to bring those voices uh, to the front. So we're talking about, well, it's, it's driven by the community organization. Each one has their own story. But what we want to get at is, why is CHA just important? Why is getting the disadvantaged community definition important? So we are working with five CBOs and CNT always, um, you know, we find funding so that our partners are funded for their involvement as well. And they are developing the content and the stories behind their communities, everything they'd like to share with us. And eventually all of that is tied to a call to action 
for their you know state officials, their local officials, and then to federal uh, agencies as well. So that's how we're working with CBOs in this this aspect. Um, but but CNT has, like I said, in CBO a well established network of. Uh, in the Chicago area of community-based organizations that we partner with. Hello, hey. Um, so I, I heard you know talk about accountability and investment, and I was, was curious. I, I didn't see it in this tool, but is there an intention to track over time how these disadvantaged areas change, right? Hopefully they'll drop from below the 90 percentile. Or is there going to be a way to see what's changing, right? Is it the environment factor? Is it the socioeconomic factor? So if you could talk a little bit more about the future plans, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, you know, when the when the um, the current release came out, our first approach was to compare it to the beta data. Um, we, um, I don't I don't know if it was a conscious decision, but we didn't expose the the beta and allow you to compare it to the current version. We just replaced uh, the data, um, but. Yeah, when the next version comes around, uh, depending on what it looks like, I think, um, yeah, that's certainly worth considering. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Please uh, thank our presenters for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you.